welcome everyone. We're waiting just a couple of minutes for participants to join us before we officially start. Uh, everything you need to log in and set up is listed here on the screen. We thank you for joining today's webinar, co-sponsored by My Brother's Keeper Alliance and Mentor. Welcome to this webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Research to Practice, Best Practices for Designing and Running Effective Mentoring Services for Boys and Young Men of Color. My name is Brian Sales, and I am the Director of Training and Technical Assistance at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Today's webinar was designed out of a partnership between Mentor and My Brother's Keeper Alliance. We're collaborating to bring you best practices for building strong relationships and designing effective mentoring services for boys and young men of color. Today's webinar is the fourth webinar we are presenting. As you can see, uh, all of the previously recorded webinars and virtual trainings are available through the links on your slide. Uh, we will put, to, put today's recording on that same web page within the next week, so please check back soon if you'd like to review today's information. In addition, we're also in the process of finalizing a guide as a part of our work with MBKA. The guide was entitled Guidebook for Mentoring Boys and Young Men of Color, which takes the elements of effective practice for mentoring and customizes it in order to focus on how issues of race and social equity impact the mentoring relationship. This guidebook will be available in mid-May, and we'll send out a follow-up email with a link to download the guidebook to all of you. Let's get started. First, we want, to, we want this to be a participatory experience, so please use the question box to ask questions throughout the webinar. Delia Gorman from Mentor will be queuing up questions to share with panelists during the Q&A portions of the webinar. The questions that you share with our panelists are generally ones that broaden or deepen the conversation. We can't really address the specific needs of a particular program during our question time. So please keep that in mind. Also, please remember that we can't get to all questions because there are a number of you on this webinar. But of course, we will try our very best. Now, let's see who's here with us today. We're going to launch our first poll. What is your experience level working with boys and young men of color? one to five years experience, six to 10 years experience, 11 to 15 years experience, and 15 plus years of experience. Okay, it looks like most of the folks here have one to five years experience of working with young boys and young men of color and the next is 15 years experience. So we have people on the front end of working in this community in this particular population and folks who've been doing this work for some time. How about our other poll? What is your role in the mentoring field? Are you a practitioner, a researcher, an educator, a government employee, or other? Please use the question and answer panel to specify. Okay, most of you are practitioners, almost half of you, uh, and then there are 29% uh, designated as other. Thank you very much. Now I think we have a good sense of who our audience is. Why don't we get the webinar started? Today's webinar will feature some expert researchers and practitioners in the field. We're pleased to announce that Dr. Bernadette Sanchez a professor of community psychology at DePaul University is with us today. She is an expert in race, ethnicity, and culture in youth mentoring. With over 30 peer-reviewed journal publications, she's received external funding for her mentoring research, including from the National Institutes of Health, and she's on the research board 
of the National Mentoring Resource Center at Mentor. Hello, Bernadette. Hi. Bernadette, tell us a little bit about your research. What do mentors and mentoring practitioners need to know about race, ethnicity, and mentoring? Sure. Um, well, I've written a couple literature reviews on the roles of race, ethnicity, and culture in youth mentoring. And in those literature reviews, we found that prior research has focused on certain processes that are important to consider in mentoring relationships. So, for instance, the cultural competence or the cultural humility you know, of the mentor, um, that can influence um, the quality of the mentoring relationship. Uh, researchers have also looked at um, cultural mistrust. So uh, youth of color might harbor cultural mistrust you know, towards white mentors specifically or sometimes towards you know, any individual who's outside of their race ethnicity because of prior or current experiences they have with racial discrimination and also because of the historical context of our country and current experiences such as you know, like the police brutality we're seeing more and more of um, that's being exposed you know, in the media, and that could influence how youth um, approach mentors and could serve as a barrier. And then also um, another important process that we found to be important is the um, racial and ethnic identity. So I can talk a little bit more about that later, but that's something that mentoring programs should consider in terms of trying to help young people develop um, a positive racial and ethnic identity. And then lastly, uh, most recently relevant for today's webinar, my research team and I and others, you know, to Paul, we've been collaborating with a local school-based peer mentoring program called the Brotherhood in Chicago, which was started by Dr. Shelby Wyatt, who's a school counselor here um, at a Chicago public high school. And this program uh, targets African American and Latino male adolescents, and we recently completed a study looking at how youth develop um, close relationships with one another, and I can talk more about that later. Thank you very much. That sounds like exciting research and much needed uh, research in our field. So thank you very much. Our next participant today is Tori Weaston Sedan, Dr. Tori Weaston Sedan. She is both a scholar and practitioner with well, with well over uh, 11 years of teaching and youth programming experience. She runs a nonprofit called the Youth Mentoring Action Network and specializes in training mentors to work with diverse populations such as black, Latino, LGBTQ, first generation students, and low income youth. And uh, as many of you may know, Tori, uh, most recently in the past year, has authored an, an article uh, on critical mentoring. And I'd like for her to talk a little bit about that. Tori, share with us what is critical mentoring why it's important for mentoring organizations to understand what this is and what they mm -hmm. can do to incorporate these uh, principles that you laid out into their work. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I really do appreciate being included. I have to start by saying that, and I'm happy that there is some interest in critical mentoring. Can everyone hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, critical mentoring is, is really about utilizing the mentoring relationship to address larger systems of inequity. Uh, I think for myself and for, and I can speak for many other mentors out there, there's been sort of a frustration with the mentoring process in that it, it, it doesn't seem to really fix some of the things that, um, that we see as problems as we go about our mentoring work. So critical mentoring is a notion that attempts to move mentoring from a dyadic or one-to-one -one relationship to a more dynamic one in which mentor and protege engage in processes of, of critical reflection and resistance. And I like to, my mentees and I like to say, um, it's a process by which mentor and protege get woke and stay woke. Um, so it's a process that's informed by proteges. They pushed me uh, and the mentors in my program to have deeper conversations mm -hmm. about their context um, it's about making sure that young people who are mar marginalized um, right. have voice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important aspect of it. And we also like to say that if we look at their context as water and air, uh, we know that, you know, based on racialized experiences, experience, experiences of class, et cetera, um, that those contexts are toxic. And so I want to try to get mentoring to a point where we are clearing the air and purifying the water. That's what critical mentoring is about. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate that description, Tori. Uh, at this time, let's turn it over to our next participant, uh, a longtime colleague of mine, Tommy McClam. He is the current Deputy Director of Open Buffalo, uh, an unprecedented collaboration of partner organizations dedicated to civic initiatives in the city of Buffalo to bring about long-term systemic improvements in justice and equity for the underserved. As the former Director of Mentoring, uh, Tommy led and provided the national training and technical assistance efforts for local Youth Build USA National Mentoring Alliance programs, consisting of over 100 programs across the United States, working with young people ages 16 to 24 from the nation's more, more challenging communities. And also as a former executive director of the Elam Community Corporation in Buffalo, New York, a community-based organization that housed the Girls to Women and Boys to Men of Faith-Based Mentoring Program. Tommy oversaw one-on-one -on -one mentoring matches for over 150 urban youth with mentors from faith-based and community-based organizations. Tommy has presented widely for numerous organizations, including the National Network of Youth Ministry, U.S. Department of Education, U.S. Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, St. Paul School District Mentoring Program, and various other national international youth development agencies. Tommy, that is an exhaustive biography, my friend. Tell us a little bit about your work, uh, how you helped to build a program uh, that puts serving boys and young men of color at the forefront of its mission. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, one of the ways you go about doing that, I think first thing is actually doing a kind of a mentoring assessment of the of the program. So so often uh, pro I see what I've seen as I travel around the country is that a lot of programs get into mentoring of uh, young young men of color, not understanding that uh, it requires a little bit more than uh, a I would say a traditional mentoring program. Uh, what they have to do is understand that there's they have to look at their program to see if they have the critical services necessary to uh, and to have a long term kind of a strategic plan for it because you'll find that mentoring uh, young men of color is a little bit more than the uh, one year one out type program it, it it's uh, type mentoring or program it's something where you require uh, kind of wraparound services so an organization has to look to see if if they are strategically prepared in a position to manage this relationship a little bit longer than a traditional mentoring program. And also, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, cultural competency and making sure those those uh, issues are there. And I was just, just excited to listen to, uh, to Bernadette and Tori, some of the things they were talking about, because all those are packed into making sure that a, uh, a organization is is actually ready in order to take on the task of mentoring young, young men of color, understanding that this is going to be kind of a long road because you have to make sure as you move down the road that you're also equipped to uh, give them the kind of those developmental assets that uh, that they have been missing and then once you you've done that also to build and build a relationship that that relation is comfortable enough uh, from the context of their ethnicity or, or their backgrounds or even if you're talking about uh, young men are coming from uh, other country countries refugees and of that sort to make sure that you're sitting in a sit in a comfortable situation where you can continue to do that and sustain it over a long period of time. Thank you very much, Tommy. I really appreciate that. Our next presenter is Diego Romero. Diego is the director of community outreach at Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City. He and his team are responsible for developing the relationships that act as capacity building partnerships for the agency to support the nearly 5,000 children it serves annually. A former mentor, Diego also volunteers on the board for Sigma Lambda Beta New York Alumni Network and the Green Bati Project, a mentoring program in Mumbai, India. Diego, can you tell us a little bit about Big Brothers Big Sisters of New York City's affinity groups model and then talk to us how does this help your organization serve boys and young men of color? Sure. Um, greetings from New York, everybody. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so uh, an issue that, that we have that, that I know a lot of organizations have, um, we serve uh, about 96% of the youth that we serve come from either the black, the Latino, or the, the Asian immigrant community uh, in New York City. But only about a third of the volunteers um, that we have coming through the pipeline come from those same communities. So about seven, a little bit over seven years ago, what the agency did is 
really put together some focus groups of our current volunteers, our, our black, Latino, and Asian volunteers, and said, ask them, where do we find more of you, right? Where do we find more big brothers and big sisters who, who come from and understand the community and the positions that our littles are coming from? And ultimately, what we developed are what we call our affinity groups, um, similar to an employee resource group that, that you might um, come across at, in the corporate environment, where volunteers um, sort of help us develop partnerships, uh, open their networks, put together special events, uh, and really help us target our marketing campaigns to speak specifically to those, those communities. So making sure that we have a robust pipeline of, of volunteers that, that look like the, the youth that are in our program. And what that does for us really is provides an opportunity for a little to see themselves in their volunteer, right? They say seeing is believing uh, and having an opportunity to, to have somebody who looks like you, sounds like you, understands where you're coming from, ultimately um, helps develop uh, a little bit of, of self-esteem and, and self-confidence in a child uh, in the long term. And um, the, the groups have really done a lot. They have increased um, that pipeline of volunteers um, from, it's dependent on the group, but anywhere from um, 30 to 70 percent increase of volunteers of color into the program. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Next slide. So my name again is Brian Sales. I'm the Director of Training at TA here at Mentor. I've been working in the youth development field over 25 years. Uh, Lots of experience running mentoring programs and also providing uh, technical assistance on a national level. Uh, done a lot of work in this field and very, very excited about today's project. Uh, again, we want to thank all of our panelists for participating in today's uh, discussion. Uh, with that, I'd like to pose our first question to the group. What considerations, and again, this is something that's come up quite a bit um, in our conversations nationally and in particular with the MPK Alliance. What considerations should mentoring organizations have in mind during the matching process with regard to matching youth with mentors across racial and ethnic groups? And then secondly, how critical is that we make how critical is it that we make that we provide um, this particular population, BYMOC, with mentors with a shared gender, background, ethnicity, or race? Let me ask Diego to kind of respond to that. Do you think it's essential? And uh, just talk to us a little bit about what your feelings are about this from your experiences. Sure. Just um, building a little bit on you know the driving force of why we developed the affinity groups. What we've learned and, and what the research has has showed us um, is that the impact that a mentor has on a child is is ultimately influenced by that volunteer's self-efficacy, right? And so um, the more that they believe in themselves and, and believe them to be um, a, a change catalyst for for the child uh, is, is really what's important. Um, but what we've found sort of uh, in, in terms of, especially with the affinity groups, is that the relationship develops much more quickly when there is some sort of connection that can be drawn between the match, right? So it's not just a stranger, but it's a stranger who understands where I'm coming from. And so to have a volunteer, as I mentioned, who looks, who sounds, who understands um, where I'm coming from, maybe the language that I speak in my home, uh, helps provide, helps sort of the volunteer peel back those layers much more quickly than somebody who doesn't have those connections. Um, and so, you know, like I said, while it's not 100% necessary to provide, you know, a, a volunteer who, who matches the profile of a mentee in order for it to be successful, it really goes a long way in, in helping the child um, really make that connection because they know that this person has, has been in my shoes, right? And, uh, and on the volunteer side, they know what decisions that this child is going to have to make because they've already made them themselves. And they understand the, the cultural and the family influences that factor into those decisions. So um, it, it's really helpful. Uh, and the, the, the lasting effect of the relationship um, is really strong when, when you have that commonality. Uh, and a lot of our matches that are same, um, the shared ethnicity, actually uh, stay in the program longer than those who, who may not share that background. Interesting. I appreciate that. Brenda, I know that you've done yeah. uh, quite a bit of research on it. Could you add to this and talk to us a little bit about what your research says, and then do you feel well, we can train people from diverse backgrounds to fulfill this role? Sure, yeah. No, I think it's really interesting to hear um, 
what Diego um, and your organization, you guys have done, and and how um, you know all the effort that you're putting into you know trying to you know recruit more mentors of color, you know, and trying to provide you know a shared background, you know, for the youth and how it's um, shown to be more effective. So one of the things that's interesting is that you know the literature. Um, there's been some research where they've compared cross-race versus same race. And because that research, the findings are mixed, some people have walked away, you know, believing that, well, race doesn't matter. You know, we don't necessarily have to uh, match by race, you know, as long as there's some other, you know, shared interest. But I think, you know, as Diego is suggesting that, um, that race and ethnicity, you know, that it does matter and that should be a consideration. So. I don't, I don't necessarily think that we always have to match, you know, by race, ethnicity. So depending on the needs, you know, of the young person, um, and maybe the context or what are the interests, what's the purpose of the program, um, you may not necessarily have to match. But for instance, let's say if a young person comes in and has internalized racism or really, you know, weak, you know, ethnic and racial identity, and that's something that you know, having a positive ethnic identity is important for the healthy development, you know, of a, of a, uh, for an adolescent of color, then perhaps, you know, um, matching, you know, with the, uh, someone of a shared, you know, race ethnicity would be important, especially someone who has a positive, you know, identity as well, to be able to show them, you know, um, you know, uh, I guess a different, um, I guess perspective, you know, or experience, and what it means to be whatever you know their race or ethnicity is, or maybe a young person has had few positive role models, you know, who've made it, you know, let's say, you know, from their background to college, and then maybe having them, you know, uh, matched up with a mentor who's of a similar race ethnicity, and someone who's gone to college would show them, like, okay, this is something that I could do in the future because they start envisioning themselves. But then maybe there are other situations where having a person of the same race or ethnicity is not necessarily as important. Maybe the young person has a strong racial ethnic identity. Maybe the purpose of the program is, let's say, to help them transition to college or maybe to help them transition to a, uh, explore possible future career interests. And they might match them up based on who's available and who's also part of that career. And maybe that maybe in that situation it's okay, but I definitely think it's something that should be considered, you know, in the process. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Tommy. Do you have any thoughts about anything related to this uh, the matching process across racial and ethnic groups, same race, cross race? Yeah, I kind of take the uh, same position. I kind of agree. It is something that has to be a part of the consideration, but it's not a, uh, a requirement. But one of the things that I would say is that when you're uh, working with young men of, of color, is that you they do want they they have to see themselves, and so you may have to uh, put together some type of hybrid. And I've done this before, where I may not have had the uh, the complement of uh, young of uh, mentors of color. And so what I had to do is do some sort of group mentoring that I uh, in, in infused into the mentoring process. And so we would have a, a young man who came from, uh, from a mentor who came from that community, who came from that kind of a life, the lifestyle, the young man we were working with. And they, they were able to see themselves. And then they, we were able to have some discussions on some issues that maybe their mentor who was of another color could not have that conversation, but provided an environment where they could still have the conversation in the same time. It was a place of cultural competency where that other mentor, the mentor who was not of color, had a chance to sit in and also they picked up some, some information and increased their competency on the, on that culture. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Tori, would you have anything to weigh in on this? Well, I agree with, with a lot of what's been said. I think my experience is to always center, to always center the young person. So I think young, young people should definitely have more of a say in who becomes their mentor, and if they're more comfortable uh, with someone who looks like them and who has a shared background, I think that mentoring program should honor that. Um, I also think that sometimes this question sort of implies that groups are homogeneous, and um, right. sometimes that can be problematic as well. I mean, just speaking mm -hmm. in terms of black folks, we have Afro-Latinos, we have Caribbean Islanders, so what we may see on the outside as someone being black um, may not necessarily mesh when we connect, you know, an African with a black person mm -hmm. or a black person with a Caribbean Islander or Afro-Latino. So I think we just have to be really mindful of the ways um, that 
these groups are very diverse. And, and again, that's why I kind of default to center the young person's voice and give them an opportunity to say uh, what they're most comfortable with. Absolutely. Do you all find class differences as well that are sort of intra-group class differences, say, for instance, an individual who might be African-American or Latino that might be, you know, of a particular socioeconomic class and educational background who wants to give back, who is willing to support, uh, you know, this young person? Are there some challenges associated based on class as well? Tori? I would definitely have to say that there are, um, to be quite frank, I've had far too many experiences where we have folks, um, and again, I just, I continue to sort of default to the black, white binary, but I've had, you know, black folks who are middle class, wealthy, come in and sort of talk down to or talk at uh, young blacks who are urban or, or poor, and I think that that can be as harmful, if not more harmful, um, than someone outside uh, of them, of, of someone who looks like them doing it. So I, and, and that's why I again go back to the idea that these things are very intersectional and very diverse and we need to just be careful about the way we approach things. And, and again, I always default to young people. If, if they have a say and what their mentoring process is like, then a lot of these things sort of get handled. The young people will tell us. They'll be honest all the time. They yeah, absolutely <laughs> will. I appreciate that honesty. Thanks so much. Brian, can yeah, I jump in? Please, right ahead. Go right ahead, Brian. Yeah, no, I, I really like what Tori's saying because I think also, um, you know, if we match, you know, a young person and an adult, you know, based on race ethnicity, I guess we're sort of assuming that there's um, a shared commonality, and in some ways there is, but there could be lots of other differences, as you're suggesting, you know, that there could be class differences, maybe it's um, some kind of generational or acculturation kinds of differences. Um, or it could be like a suburban or urban, you know, in terms of where someone grew up or religion, you know, so there could be other things that, you know, that they sort of have to overcome in trying to get to know each other. So I think it's important that we don't always assume, you know, that there's going to be understand shared understanding because they are of a similar race or ethnicity. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. And in line with that, I want to move to our next slide and ask a question here. And since we're talking with Bernadette, um, I want to talk hear your thoughts on, you talked a lot about uh, positive ethnic or racial identity. And I know that the research supports this in so many ways, young people having a positive ethnic or racial identity. How do you find mentors in the programs that either you work with or the research, um, how do you help, how do mentors help them develop that positive ethnic racial identity, uh, whether or not they share this identity or not? Yeah, sure. Okay, so first, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, what Brian just said, that um, having a positive racial or ethnic identity is an important part of the healthy development of youth of color, you know, including boys of color. So there's been research that shows that having a stronger or positive racial ethnic identity is related to lots of other positive kinds of outcomes, such as academic, psychological, or social outcomes, and it could also prevent negative kinds of outcomes such as pop, um, problem behaviors. So I think it's important then that youth mentoring programs take this into consideration and how can we support youth in developing boys of color to develop a positive, you know, a strong um, racial or ethnic identity because it does, it is related to so many other um, positive outcomes. So I think mentors, um, no matter what their race or ethnicity, you know, could help and, and staff as well could help young people in exploring their racial or ethnic heritage. What does their race mean to them or their ethnicity mean to them? Um, helping youth explore the positive contributions, you know, of their racial or ethnic group, especially to counter a lot of the negative messaging that boys of color are getting about who they are, you know, and about their community and about their culture. So, for instance, um, you know, in a recent study that one of my students and I did, we looked at um, the role of racial discrimination and ethnic identity in Latino boys' um, economic <clears throat> value of education. And that's basically the idea that earning an education will pay off and leading to good jobs and earning a good income. And we found that the boys in our study compared to the girls were more um, negatively or more sensitive to the negative effects of racial discrimination, but that ethnic identity, you know, having a positive ethnic identity helped, um, I guess, lessen the negative effects. So 
ethnic identity mm-hmm. could also be seen as a positive um, coping tool, you know, mm-hmm. for boys of color and helping them deal with all these stress, you know, stressors that they might be experiencing in their life. That's fantastic. That's great research. I know coming from uh, youth development field, I know we did lots of sort of cultural enrichment um, activities with young people, and to see that the mentoring research uh, and the youth development research in general is sort of aligned with that practice, it's great to see the alignment happening. Uh, Tommy, you've got lots of experience, obviously, in programs. What, what is your sense about building positive racial and ethnic identity? Uh, what are some practices or uh, some some uh, um, thoughts that you may have about uh, things that you've done in the past programmatically to help build positive racial and ethnic identity? Brian, I think it, for me, it, it first starts in the actual training aspect where uh, actual, actual cultural competency is built into the, the initial training of the uh, of the mentor, uh, ment- you know, cultural competency can kind of be a kind of a two-edged sword. Is uh, on one side, uh, you have you're looking for mentors, and you assume that they have cultural com- competency because they come from a certain community or or some certain ethnic ethnic group, and that that's not necessarily true. And so, I think a lot of times, uh, organizations we see someone who's could be a uh, black or Latino, and we have these assumptions, and based upon those assumptions, we we start doing matches. Matching. So I believe that training, uh, begin training co- with cultural competency embedded in the training on the front end is one of the things I've seen uh, work successful. And then the, the one of the other is that uh, just I think some of the same items we see with mentoring just in general is that uh, making sure that uh, the individual is not coming in to fix the young person, is that uh, they're not coming in with the idea of that young person that is broken. Right. Yeah, but that young person is just uh, has, has uh as they deal with them and even in the areas of culture, that they understand that culture is something, it's, it's a learned behavior. It, culture competency is a learned behavior. And so that mentor understand it's going to be a learning process. It's not something they're going to get on the front end. But that culture of competency learning not only takes place with the mentor, but it takes place even after the match is made. And the mentor and the mentee also learn each other. And I think we have to kind of be open to that understanding that it's not it's not always going to be the perfect cultural match, and a lot of the learning will take place over the uh, the time the time of the relationship. Absolutely, I appreciate that. So I didn't know if you want to weigh in on that now, or you wanted to hold off when we start talking about training. But if you have something to add, uh, feel free to. Um, no, I think I'll wait for the training question. <laughs> well, why don't we do this? Why don't we check back in and just see uh, with Delia or Jennifer. Do we have any questions uh, at this time? If you do have questions, just uh, go ahead and type them in the question box. Uh, I'm not seeing any right now, so perhaps you don't have any. So. Why don't we do this? Why don't we go ahead and uh, get into another uh, another line of questioning here? And since I have uh, Tori um, back here, talk to us a little bit about, I mean, you've been sort of, uh, you know, this practitioner, scholar, expert on critical mentoring. And one of the things that I remember from reading and then talking with you about how to prepare mentors in line with what Tommy's talking about. But what would be some considerations um, that are very important in both matching and training uh, and particularly maybe the training area, because I think that that's where you're sort of heading with your research. Uh, I don't mean mm-hmm. to overstep or anything, but just talk and share with us a little bit about what considerations uh, you think are vital and some practices that folks involve from the work that you've done. Right. So I, I think what's important and, and really what we're here talking about in general is just the fact that we need folks to understand how to mentor other people's children. Um, And we need folks who don't want to understand how to do that to let other people uh, mentor Mm. other people's children. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's stolen from Lisa Delpit. Lisa Delpit, yeah. But I think the idea is is that, you know, we need to approach mentoring. And I like very much what, what Tommy had to say about, you know, not utilizing the savior approach. And that was actually something that I was going to highlight. We need people to approach the mentoring relationship, understanding who these young people are and being able to deal with their context and to be able to critically understand their context, their humanity, um, the range of being that they have. Uh, they, need, they need mentors to, bo- to get them. 
um, and to be able to um, to be in it to be in it with them. They don't need saving in the traditional ways that we think they do. Um, they need their identities valued, validated. They need their minds and feelings acknowledged. And I think when when mentoring programs go to a recruit mentors. Um, and this actually harkens back to what uh, Diego was saying earlier. When they go to recruit mentors, they need to be careful in the way they recruit them so that the mentor has a solid understanding of what mentoring is. And I would also say what mentoring is not so that they don't get it twisted before they even come through the door. Um, and then at that, yes, and then at that point, I think the mentoring program has a responsibility to sort of have these hard conversations about what's happening, um, again, in the, in the context of these young people, and then how do we address it uh, within our mentoring relationships. And again, what Tommy said, um, I was actually going to note Dr. Chris Emden. He recently released a book called For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and the Rest of Y'all Too. Um, and he discusses the imperative of ridding ourselves of the savior approach to teaching, and I think that this is appropriately translated into mentoring, um, that we're not, you know, sort of reaching in to save these young people, that they are, they have a lot that we don't even understand that we don't get. They have a richness. They have a knowledge. They have ways of navigating the world. And so our jobs really are to provide love, support, compassion, encouragement to get out of the way of these young people, as I say. And so I think in our training, we have a responsibility to, to get mentors to understand that, to be able to do that. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I really appreciate that. And can you say the title of the book and the author's name again for our folks? Yes, it's Dr. Chris Emden, um, and he has his recent book is called For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and the Rest of Y'all Too. All right. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Diego, share with us, because a lot of the work that obviously you're doing, and uh, Diego works with the Coast Sisters of New York City, and for many of you who have sort of a historical Understanding Big Brothers Big Sisters is the first mentoring program formalized, and uh, he works for the actual first organization. But can you share with us a little bit about what Tori talked about, uh, in particular, around considerations um, for uh, this particular topic as it relates to cross-cultural and cross-racial? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so when it comes to mentoring, especially, there is a huge difference between sympathy and empathy, right? And so what we really try to do is, through our training, is, is empower a volunteer to really take a look and, and try to understand, you know, where, where the child is coming from. They've, they've heard, they've been viewed from this, our, our littles have been viewed from a deficit perspective long mm -hmm. enough, narrative that they've heard over and over and over again. And so I, what Tori was speaking to was figuring out what they're good at, what they want to do, right, and getting them to be better at it, getting them to where they want to be. Um, you know, we're, I think Tommy said it perfectly. We're, we're not there, you know, big brothers, mentors aren't there to fix children, right? They're not broken. Um, so what, what our training really does is, uh, you know, it shares, one, the 111-year the body of knowledge we've accumulated, right? We, we've seen almost everything uh, in that time. But to really help place uh, a volunteer in, in the shoes if, if they haven't been there before, right? So when you're talking about mm -hmm. cultural matching, um, you know, you've probably never had to think about things that that, that child is thinking about. And um, we're talking about staffing as well, right? That's why, you know, at the backbone of our program are the social workers that we employ, because they're the ones that can help provide that context, help educate on cultural competency so that the volunteer can really integrate it in that match relationship to make sure that the child is getting the most out of out of the experience as possible. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Tommy or Bernadette, would you like to weigh in on this at all? Um, I just wanted to uh, just reiterate, you know, what um, others have said about using that savior, you know, perspective or the deficit perspective. So I think that you know, something we do a lot, you know, either in mentoring or just in other kinds of youth development programs and working with um, boys of color. And I wanted to note there's this report out there um, you could find online called Being Black is Not a Risk Factor and Taking mm -hmm. a Strength-Based Approach, you know, in Working with um, Black Youth. And I think, you know, obviously that applies to, you know, other youth of color as well. So, you know, trying to, how can we 
I guess, um, train mentors to have more of this strengths-based perspective when working with youth and trying to find, you know, the positive, the positive and capitalize, you know, on those strengths, you know, when they're working with them rather than focusing on the deficits. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Tommy, anything? It's just something that is kind of from the more practical. I, I've actually uh, done it in just in the uh, in practicing is having the mentors actually come, the mentors come in and having the young people actually speak to the mentors. And when I say not necessarily in a training session, but almost like you're using, you're doing group mentoring for mentors, and you let mm-hmm. the young people be the teacher, and they, and they begin to speak things in, into into being some of the. Uh, cultural issues that come up and and I believe that and I've seen in, in those situations that the mentors have learned more from the young people than uh, than they thought they would learn so the, and so it, you see a, a shift takes place where where they see the young people more as assets and, and not mm-hmm. quote, liabilities absolutely so we're talking about a strength-based perspective right we're talking about reframing and moving from the deficit approach and looking at children as problems and now looking at them as you know, um, their own assets that they have, uh, but seeing them as people who have their own particular strengths and just beginning to leverage that and helping them enhance that in many ways, and that's what mentors do. I wonder, uh, for all of you, uh, slightly off the script here, does the mentoring field in general promote sort of, uh, or at least in your experiences, kind of promote the notion that these kids are, you know, at risk or, or um, and just promote it in a way that the way in which we sort of attract and mobilize mentors, it in some ways maybe feeds that whole mentality about this deficit thinking and deficit model or are there some larger societal forces that shape that, whether it be funding or policy and things of that nature. Okay, I can jump in. This is Bernadette. I think it's a combination of those things, Brian, that you're saying. I think mm-hmm. in some ways the mentoring field does feed into this perspective. You know, so when um, I think sometimes this, well, I guess yet yeah, some of the stereotype, you know, of a mentoring program, and I think, you know, out of its origins, you know, come, you know, most of the youth that we're serving, you know, are high need youth, you know, and then if they think of a um, a brown, you know, a black, you know, boy who needs, you know, support, I think that there are some, you know, some of the stereotypes, like, oh, here are these outsiders are going to come in and help them, you know, and save them from whatever the conditions are, you know, in their environment. So I think in some ways the mentoring field does um, enforce that, but, you know, the mentoring field obviously operates within a larger context. Our society, I think, you know, um, uh, also, you know, fuel, you know, that kind of mindset and perspective. I'm sure. Just Thank jump in, Brian. Go ahead. Just jump in to say, even from the standpoint of when we're we're talking about funding, and we're talking about funding and grant writing, and yeah. you you write the grant from the from the standpoint of a deficit. Uh, I'm gonna he, I'm gonna heal some deficit, and so I think mm-hmm. it, it starts from the beginning, uh, from the funding source all the way through, even from the monitoring from the monitoring of, of the grant. It's always looking at. So I think it's gonna be a, almost a shift in the field that has to take place in order that we start looking at young people a little bit different. Absolutely. I agree. Um, <laughs> sorry, about, sorry, Brian. No, I absolutely agree with what Dr. Sanchez and what Tommy, have, uh, what both of them have said. I think really looking at shifting the structure, uh, which is what Tommy was just saying, and making that point about even writing the need statement and the need statement having right. highlight, you know, all of the negative things that mentoring can come and fix. And we talk about. Yeah not having mm-hmm. the savior approach from the mentor perspective, but mentoring programs, mentoring structures, the ways in which we're funded um, are set up that way in the first place. So it's hard not to automatically pass that on to mentors um, as we recruit them. So I do think that that's a definite, a definite structure that has to shift. I think looking at areas of research like appreciative inquiry, where we mm-hmm. look at what's right with young people, we've already been saying this in a number of ways in terms of strength. Uh, based approach, but I think there are ways that we can do this, um, even in terms of our structure, even in terms of our grant writing, and even in terms of how we start to sort of push funders to look at um, how to how to fund us differently 
um, and how to hold us accountable for the funding differently than we have before. If we're going to do work that's, that's more transformative, um, we shouldn't be writing the same need statements every year. Right. Okay. Absolutely. I really appreciate you all sharing that. I guess that kind of leads us to this question, uh, and I'll start with Tommy. You know, we, we talk about cultural competency. We talk about training. We all recognize the need that we're all one human family, and we recognize some of the differences related uh, to people's experiences, both historical and contemporary. What are some of the, the biggest mistakes that you've seen uh, from your experience uh, as a program uh, uh, director, Tommy, with mentors from different cultural or racial groups when they're mentoring young boys and uh, young men of color? Yeah, that, that's, that's a kind of easy question for me, uh, softball, is that first thing I see is that mentors who come in and uh, they try and be someone that they're not. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing with young people is uh, they can sense that right away and be they young men of color or be a young people in general. And I think that that's the number one, I think, is they're, they're coming in with the mentality of, of being something that they're really not. And young young uh, people I've uh, been working with, uh, they more so look for a, uh, a sense of uh, that the person is going to be uh, sincere in who they are. And then, therefore, they, as they work through the relationship, the relationship is... Uh, it's not a uh, it's not a facade, and so uh, young people are, are are turned off very quickly by facade. So I think that would be the number one for me is that a mentor trying to be something that they're not. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to add anything? Okay. Um, what's the most important thing? And I think this is an important question in so many levels. What's the most important thing that a mentor of a young man or boy of color needs to remember to fulfill their role. That's the most important thing that a mentor needs to do to fulfill their role. And I guess I'll start off with Bernadette. Sure. Um, well, in our recent project that we were doing with the Brotherhood on the school-based uh, male mentoring program, um, we found that um, what was really important and what the young people kept telling us in the interviews, what they were getting so much out of it, is that it was they had a safe space to be emotionally vulnerable and I'm bringing this up because you know our society you know we have this stereotype that boys are not necessarily as interested in the emotional um, aspect you know of relationships but also um, you know at least with the participants you know that we were um, uh, studying Latino and African American males you know in our society you know they're stereotyped as you know hyper masculine you know for instance and then that might influence the kind of mentoring work you know that we do and what we what we assume their needs are and other researchers have looked at this such as Renee Spencer you know who's done some work around uh, male mentoring relationships but also Naomi Way who's done some work on boys friendships and we found that you know similar to their work that um, are the young people you know in this program they kept expressing a desire for emotional closeness and what they valued you know about the brotherhood program is that it allowed them to do that you know so they had you know of course the stereotypically male kinds of activities in the program you know so mm -hmm. they played different games they played sports but they also had moments you know in time in the program where you know the they had the chance to explore some of you know the social emotional parts of you know themselves and they appreciated being able to develop these close relationships with other males you know in a safe space. So I just wanted to bring that up because I think that you know it's important to consider both the gender and race kind of um, uh -huh. issues that might be coming up for, for boys of color and how can we help them develop in a healthy way. And Bernard, that's fantastic. I really think that's so important to talk about emotional vulnerability with boys in particular, boys who may have experienced their various forms of trauma. Can you yes. also add to our discussion about some very specific activities that might help some folks who are online uh, who are program coordinators? Are there some, some uh, best practices or some particular activities? Yeah. Well, know? in this program, they did a lot of um, different kinds of rapport building activities that were led by older youth. So it's a peer yeah. mentoring program where okay. the older youth, um, so let's say in the high school setting, you know, the older or the ones who've been in the program longer are sort of the leaders, you know, of the program. And then there's the, the newer ones or the younger ones are more of the mentee kind of role. 
And they do a lot of different kinds of team building activities, you know, in the beginning, but also throughout the school year because sometimes students jump in and out of the program. And in those team building activities, the older ones especially, they model, you know, these moments of vulnerability, you know, to allow the, the younger ones to say, see that it's okay, that you can do this without sacrificing your masculinity and that this is a safe space where you can do that, you know. So, so they do different kinds of, um, you know, activities where they get to explore some of those things. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Anybody else like to respond? Uh, again, what is what's the most important thing that a mentor uh, of a young man or boy of color needs to remember to fulfill their role? I think uh, I just jump in. Uh, one of the things I just kind of also want to highlight is that I think we, when we use the term, uh, uh, even boys and young men of color, that we have to often remember that it, it encapsulates uh, encapsulates urban, suburban, rural, different cultures and and affinity groups. So I think we have to be careful not uh, even as we do that lumping all of our our young people together. And, and I just remember a, a story where I actually. Uh, I, I did that as a mentor, and there was a young man who was from Sudan, and, and we were playing basketball. He became an excellent basketball player. But one of the things that uh, he always wore sweatpants, and I, it took two years for I finally realized why he was wearing those sweatpants. He actually took two years to tell me he had been shot in the leg and just some of the horrendous things that he had went through. But he didn't want to talk about those because that it, that issue brings up the scar, the scar brings up the story, and, and then he has to relive. And so I think it, it, it touches the emotional place. It may take time, I think, for mentors understand that some of the uh, scars, some of the issues that our young men are dealing with emotionally, it's not going to come out right away. It may take time. So that's why I kind of started out saying that uh, when you're mentoring young men of color, it's not uh, kind of a one year and out thing. It may be a much longer period of time. It's very interesting. I really appreciate that. Uh, Tommy, if you don't mind, maybe you could share some experiences that you share with me specifically related to the length of time. Um, we, we've had some very interesting conversations over the years uh, to help elucidate uh, your natural mentoring relationship, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Yeah. Well, one of the things that even when we, when we were able to realize that uh, we came from a community working in a, uh, a uh, housing project, uh, which is a, a fairly large housing project, a lot of young men without fathers. And so one of the things we realized is that uh, we were asking young men to come in and be, you know, have a mentor, and but we had a uh, time frame on it. And so what they were looking for is a long-term relationship, and we want to give them a relationship with a time frame. And so one of the things we had to do in our recruiting of mentors is to change the way we recruited mentors. We no longer ask for, for uh, put time frames on, and that's something totally different from the, how, how uh, in the mentoring field is taught. We had to say, ask the uh, the mentors to to come in with an open ended time frame is that we didn't know how long how long it would be and and so we actually would recruit it with that that was our tag for recruiting recruiting and over a period of time what we saw was those relationships and those bonds they they just grew faster because the young person and the mentor knew that the relationship they had no it had no termination date on it and so they both had had committed so we're asking young people to give their heart. Yeah, they give their heart to a relationship, but we're only going to last for a year. They're not going to do that. And in this community, they were looking for strong male role models and when they came along. And so the matches, as a matter of fact, some of those matches, a majority of those matches are still going on today. Uh, I have one young man who I, we're at our we're at a 25-year mark now of mentoring. Wow. And he's assistant principal of a, of, a, of a high school now. And it started way back there when he knew that it was – it was a it was an open ended relationship. Oh, that's fantastic. I really appreciate that. I think those are some lessons learned uh for the mentoring field, both traditional uh or formalized mentoring and informal mentoring. I wanna give Diego and Tori a, a chance to respond if they liked this time. Sure. Um I, I wanna thank Tommy. I, I think having that idea of no termination date on the relationship is is huge. Um it, it's a really great way to to approach it and I think something I can actually start implementing so so I appreciate that. Um but something uh, you know to really um keep in mind for for the volunteers are two things. The first is that there are very few people in this world who 
make it completely on their own, right? Everybody has had a mentor in some way, shape, or form. They just probably right. didn't call them a mentor. It was a coach. It was a teacher. It was a neighbor. It was somebody who helped you through a hard time, and it probably didn't happen overnight, right? So building on what Tommy's talking about, how it, it takes time, right? Volunteers often don't feel like they're getting through to a child because the child isn't quite ready to let them in 100%, uh, understandably so. But know that every time that you meet, every conversation that you have is building towards something, right? And eventually what, what we found, we, we brought in a focus group of, of volunteers who had been matched for over three years and asked them, you know, what, what's the secret? How are you so successful? And they said, all of them across the board said, it was really hard for the first few months because I didn't feel like I was making an impact. But each of them had this, what we call now, like their aha moment where it finally hit them that everything that they said was being internalized by the, by the kid. Uh, and, and they were actually helping that child, you know, get to where they want to be. And so making sure that as, as staff and, you know, we're providing the resources to the volunteers, but um, just really starting them off with, with that initial training and letting them know, it might take a little while, but trust that everything you're doing is having an impact. And if you can remember that, it's going to get you through that hurdle. And ultimately, you know, you're probably going to have a friend for the rest of your life. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounds as though it seems like we may be having a few technical difficulties uh, in terms of hearing. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, a majority of you all, and we apologize for the technical difficulties so, uh, at this time. Um, I'd like to, again, pose that same question. And Diego, thank you for that uh, very thoughtful response. I'd like to pose that same question to give Tori an opportunity to speak uh, to this particular question about uh, what a mentor of young, uh, what a, a mentor can uh, provide to a young man or boy of color, what they need to remember. So I agree with, again, I agree with a lot of what, the, what my uh, fellow panelists have said, and you guys have said it so well, so beautifully. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I will say that I think this issue of respectability politics um, with young men and boys of color is something that we really need to sort of critically interrogate in the mentoring field. I think for me that would be the one aspect that I would point out in terms of really trying to work through how do we help our young people accept themselves, value their culture, be okay with who they are, be able to live comfortably in their skin, um, and still also teach them about how to dress professionally when it's necessary. Um, too often, I think some of our mentoring with a lot of our mentoring, I'll be honest, um, around young boys and, and men of color is about how do we present ourselves, which I think is problematic. Um, because it doesn't allow the mentoring relationship to really talk about that it doesn't matter how we present ourselves, <laughs> um, that, we, that we're still going to deal with the larger issues of inequity, that it doesn't matter if you're Trayvon Martin with a hoodie on, um, that it doesn't matter if you're President Obama who wears a suit, um, that you're still going to have to deal with the realities of being a young man, a boy of color in this country. And so I think for me, one of the most important aspects is really starting to interrogate the respect po respectability politics that tend to go along with mentoring these young men and these young boys. And so, thank you for sharing that. Uh, for perhaps for those uh, listeners that may not be familiar with uh, both respectability politics, would you be able to talk a little bit about that and kind of define what that is and uh, sort of share with us what you mean by that in terms of interrogating uh, the culture, if you will. Right. Well, I, respectability politics, simply put, is just more is, is having conversations about presenting yourself in a, way, in a way that's appropriate to society in an effort to protect yourself um, mm. from, the, from what's happening in terms of racialized experiences, et cetera. So, you know, so many of us are having questions with or having conversations with our young men and boys and saying things like you need to pull your pants up or you, you can't wear hoodies or you need to always present yourself in this sort of non-threatening way that, that sort of displaces, A, you know, their, their youth um, because they're young and they should be able to have fun in terms of what they look like. Um, and again, I'm not dismissing the idea that they don't need to learn professional dress for 
you know, for very real reasons. But I think when we have these conversations about using dress, using our appearance um, to alleviate race or racial experience, that that's when we, it becomes a problem because we're telling our young people that they can't look like themselves if they want to avoid being killed or if they want to avoid being harassed or, or if they want to avoid being targeted. Um, and we know that that isn't the case because, again, the President of the United States, um, who is one of the most respectable men, you know, arguably, um, is still experiencing very real racism on, on a daily basis. So we need to just have more nuanced conversations around that piece. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Well, what I'd like to do now, and thank you for sharing that story, um, your explanation of respectability politics and sort of interrogating deep culture and having uh, both a, a firm sort of approach uh, societally in terms of how we uh, need to balance uh, respectability politics and, you know, racial identity. Uh, along with just recognizing the importance of youth uh, voice and youth advocacy. Uh, let me sort of turn the conversation a little bit now. Um, there's some questions that are coming up around sort of programmatic uh, types of um, uh, characteristics related to uh, screening. And one of the questions that comes up, and this often is a question that comes up on some levels, what questions uh, can you ask during the volunteer screening and an enrollment process to gauge and understand cultural competency. What questions can you ask? And again, this is again more of a programmatic question. Uh, perhaps uh, Diego or Bernadette uh, or uh, Tommy and Tori, you may have some thoughts about that. Well, this is Tommy. I would just jump in there. What uh, one of the ways we use to kind of gauge the cultural cultural compasses is to the we interview all of our uh, we interview all of our mentors. So by interviewing the mentors, we ask questions uh, regarding you know they tell us a little bit about their 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 background, uh, basically you know where they live, where they're coming, where they came up, uh, their history, and then from uh, that what we do is kind of compile a. a a profile, but not using that profile necessarily to give them a, a grade of cultural competency, competency grade, but to kind of make sure that when we do the training, that that those areas in which we had a little few flags came up, we make sure that those areas are covered in the uh, in the training. So it, you know, if that mentor actually goes through the, the entire process, so that it, it's more of an interview process, and it's not a uh, you know one question or one or two questions, and okay, now I got it. It's kind of looking at the whole person and and kind of the background and what brought them to to that chair in order to be a mentor. Thank you, Daniel. Any thoughts? Sure, I'll add um, a couple questions that we ask just to gauge where they're at. Is what do you want to get out of this? Like, why are you here, right? And then what do you feel you have to offer? And that's where you can sort of get an understanding of where that volunteer is coming from. They'll tell you, you know, if if they think if they have that savior complex, right? They'll, they're very open about it. Um, and, and it gives you a little bit of insight um, during that interview to know, hey, this is, this is the understanding of, or this is, yeah, this is the understanding of, of where this volunteer thinks our kids are coming from and helps us determine, you know, for the most part, you know, we can, through training, get them to where they need to be. Um, but it helps us figure out which child is going to be the best fit for them moving forward. Absolutely. Have you come across in your work, I mean, you've done a lot of work uh, in this area in research. Are there particular questions that you found programs asking uh, or are there questions that you help to develop in uh, this whole notion around uh, developing, or I should say developing, but just trying to determine how culturally confident um, uh, mentors are when beginning the process of becoming a mentor? Yeah, we've had um, in some recent trainings um, that folks have done, we haven't done, we've, we've started doing some research on this. We started looking at um, some, uh, I guess, cultural competence, you know, kinds of questions, trying to see if they have sort of like a systemic understanding, you know, of, uh, or I guess framework, you know, in how they look at people's situation, um, how comfortable they feel like, you know, um, working, you know, across, you know, difference. Um, and, and, and then we also have a measure that sort of gets at, um, 
youth perceptions about their mentors, you know, how supportive, you know, they are uh, about their, um, the youth race, ethnicity, and, you know, do they feel like, you know, the, the mentor is culturally sensitive? Absolutely. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Tori, were there any questions that you might be using in either your trainings or screenings, or have we sort of hit on all those at this time? Perhaps you have something you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think they covered it. I, uh, again, I would okay. just add that I think young people should be involved in the process. Interesting. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, you've been a very strong advocate in the short time that I've known you about youth voice. Um, how mm -hmm. would you sort of envision, or if you're doing this now in your own program, how does a young person engage in that screening process? Are they interviewing the mentor? Uh, you know, talk to me a little bit. I don't want to sort of steal your thunder there. No, no, it's okay. I think, I mean, I think this can look differently for different programs. Uh -huh. You certainly uh -huh. can have young people interview their mentor. You can have young people pick their mentors, um, still utilizing a really informed process. But I think... Okay. Just, just the fact that we include them is the first step. I mean, I don't want to say that, that there have to be very specific ways uh, for it to be done, but I just think that we often get so caught up in our sort of managerial bu bureaucratic aspects or bureaucratic, I'm sorry, aspects um, where we're, you know, we want to get people matched and we have these, these really complicated process, processes for doing so, um, but we forget to ask the young people. Um, it could just mean even just having some young people who mentor or who, um, who are involved in the interview for all mentors. It doesn't have to be that each young person interviews their own mentors. It could be that you have two or three um, mentoring or two or three young people who are involved in, you know, processing, screening, all of the mentors. I just think that it's important for them to have a say in some way or another. Absolutely. I think that would be a fascinating new approach. Uh, you see it in other youth development activities, in particular around hiring staff. So why not have a, uh, some mentor, or excuse me, some mentees, or even past mentees be a part of that uh, screening process? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a fantastic, and that's something we probably should look at more formally. Um, hey Brian, go right here. Um, yeah, going off of, um, I was just thinking too that um, that with the mentors. It's not just, you know, understanding, I guess, you know, where they're coming from or if they're comfortable across difference and all that, but also I think it's important to get them to also explore, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's their own, you know, cultural heritage, their own values and how that might influence um, their day-to-day -day interactions, but also, um, you know, helping them explore, you know, whether it's through training, you know, their own assumptions, but their own privileges as well, you know, so and how that might influence how they perceive, you know, the youth and their interactions, too. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I mean, obviously, uh, Steve Vaster, who you all may have met uh, the, uh, on a previous uh, webinar, uh, does uh, a privilege walk, uh, which explores and uh, interrogates, to use uh, uh, Tori's uh, um, language. Um, it looks at the history and the culture of in the background of those who want to mentor, regardless of their racial, ethnic, gender, or sexuality, is it just get a better understanding of who you are. Because now you're going to engage and work with a young person. You need to be aware of your own biases. So thank you again for bringing that up. I think that's really critical in training to offer something like that. Uh, it looks as though, just sort of turning, that we may have some other questions. Uh, I think it's Heather from uh, My Brother's Keeper Alliance, Adelia. Are there some other questions that maybe perhaps I don't see at this time, or do we want to open up the lines for folks who may want to ask questions? How do you all want to yeah. first? Yeah, Brian, and Celia, I'd love to um, ask some questions that we've been getting tons and tons of questions from uh, our participants. So thank you, everybody. We wish we could answer all of them. Um, but here's a couple um, that have come in. What value do sports-based or other group-based mentoring programs have in the landscape of programming for boys and young men of color? Hoping that some of the panelists could speak to that question. The questions about group based mentoring? That's right, or sports based, team based okay. programs. Or sports, okay, sports, okay, got it. Um, what it, can I just mention? I guess I could answer something um, related to that. Um, I recently wrote up a um, literature review of mentoring um, 
uh, mentoring programs for black uh, boys and adolescents. And, and one of the things that I've noticed in the mentoring, I guess the programs that have been evaluated, what comes up is a lot of these are group-based programs. And when you read, you know, why um, the developers made it a group-based program, you know, um, part of it was because of cultural values. You know, so cultural values, you know, for interdependence and communalism, you know, which also applies, for instance, to, you know, Latinos who also, you know, have values for collectivism, you know, and group, you know, um, or familism, let's say. So, um, so I think there is something to these group-based kinds of interventions because they are consistent with some of the cultural values, you know, for um, the, the, the groups, you know, that we might be targeting, you know, in our mentoring programs. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to respond? Uh, do you want to, you can, you want to ask some more questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to ask another question. We're getting actually a number of questions about school-based mentoring programs and how to navigate um, the administrative systems that are in place in school-based mentoring programs, specifically how to incorporate critical mentoring um, within school-based programs. Any of our panelists can speak to that question. Um, I like can. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So I, um, the work that I do with the Youth Mentoring Action Network is, in fact, more of a school-based program than it is a community-based program. And what we've done is we've caused a lot of problems, I'll be honest and say that, um, because we have challenged a lot of the systems and structures that are on school campuses, um, and on our particular campus. And that's not to say that we don't work well with student, with staff and faculty, you know, and faculty and administrators, we do, but we've had really critical conversations with them about the differences between us mentoring young people to adapt to structures that are bad for them, um, and actually partnering with our young people to resist some of those structures. Uh, and so we do, and just to speak to the sort, the folks who are um, sort of focused on metrics. We do have 100% of our young people graduate from high school. We're a high school-based program. 98% uh, of them go on to college. Of the ones who go on to college, every single one of them stay in college and graduate. So we are doing the things that most, most folks would care about in terms of um, getting young people to be successful. But along the way, we are saying, if there's a particular problem with this system, we need to partner with our young people to question that to have conversations about it, and then we need to be to advocate for them as they move forward to try to, to change that, to change those structures. Um, and I, I speak specifically to things like the school to prison pipeline. A lot of uh, schools who want us to set up school-based mentoring programs, one of the first things they want us to talk about are, you know, how can we get this group of young people that you're going to mentor to behave? And so we have to have conversations about what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> What does that mean to your school? What does that mean in your classroom? And, and, and when you say behave, do you mean that in culturally relevant ways? Um, and so they don't always like it, but I think that they end up having a stronger mentoring program because they, they too get to sort of look at their structures and say, oh, well, maybe it's not just the kids that I'm putting in this mentoring program to get fixed, back to that yeah. point. Um, but it's that maybe some things in our school can be adapted to make things a little more relevant for these young people so that we're not uh, disproportionately disciplining or just trying to get them to shut up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's like this new phenomenon uh, in my son's school, uh, elementary age, where the kids couldn't talk, right? They, they had to sit still. I mean, these are elementary age kids that couldn't really talk louder than a whisper in the lunchroom because the adults couldn't handle that, you know, and um, it's, it's just, it's, yeah, I'm not, not here to bash schools or anything since I've got family members in it, but I, I think what you're talking about is very important, so I appreciate you sharing that. I'm sure there's some other questions. Oh, go ahead, Tom. I was going to, I think that goes back to even when we opened up is that looking at the actual program and the program began assessing themselves first, especially in the area of cultural competency, mm -hmm. to see where they are before you start bringing mentors in. Because if you bring mentors into an organization that is not culturally competent, the mentors will actually pick up the same, uh, pick, will pick up the environment. 
And so Absolutely. I think that's it's critical that uh, in, in the beginning of the organization takes it take a step back and look at okay how how are we handling culture within the context of our organization. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Delia, um, we've got about uh, a good 15 minutes or so. I'm sure there's other questions that you have. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, take over here and run the show a little bit? <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so um, we've been getting quite a number of uh, questions from our participants about something that several of the panelists spoke about, which is the importance of emphasizing diversity within the group that we refer to as boys and young men of color. Um, so specifically, participants are asking, if our panelists have any specific insights about serving specific communities of boys and young men of color, including Native youth and recently immigrated youth. I can touch on that a little bit. Um, we actually run a program for, for um, new, either children who are immigrants themselves or come from um, new immigrant families. Um, but something I, I can say that, that we've really tried um, to develop as a best practice is providing volunteers the opportunity to work together, right? Um, and so even though we are a one-to-one -one program, we like to bring them together so that they can learn from each other because, you know, like, like we've said, you know, I can have 10 Latino volunteers and it's not going to be a homogenous group. So to know how your peers are handling situations and scenarios that you're going to be going through is, is really a great value for, for a volunteer to know, to, to hear it from somebody who's doing it or maybe has just done it as opposed to hearing it somebody from, from the agency um, or from an organizational standpoint. Um, you know, it's, they're going to be able to look at the specifics of, of their situation and give the best advice possible as opposed to maybe even, you know, the agency can, you know, when we're giving sort of more general advice on, on how to handle situations. And so I think empowering them and enabling um, mentors to really communicate with each other and learn from each other is, is something that, uh, again, is extremely valuable for, for their experience. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. I don't know if anyone else wanted to um, chime in on that particular question. I know it's a, it's a multifaceted one. Uh, this is Tommy. Just uh, had uh, some several situations with a uh, a refugee community here in the uh, in our area, and one of the uh, situation I had where I was talking with one of the parents, and and they actually told me having outsiders be become caretakers, and they and we were talking about mentoring, but they kept saying caretaker, and so they were looking at mentor as a mentor as being a caretaker, and so just understanding that the uh, there's a difference in even in perception. And so when we're talking about mentoring, we're talking from the Western, from a Western uh, perspective, and a lot of times other cultures you're talking to, you have to understand exactly how they're looking at mentoring as more of a, a, a caretaker's role. And that was not an acceptable practice to be a, a be a caretaker. And so we had to have some conversation to the point where they realized I didn't want to be a caretaker. I just want to assert it was more of a service to assist. And once we had that conversation, you saw the community kind of open up a little bit more to having mentors in, in, uh, in their community. Um, this is Bernadette. Could I say something too? Um, some of the uh, programs we've worked with, or and the youth we worked with, are Latino youth. And here in Chicago, many of the youth are either first or second generation um, immigrant youth. So most of them are coming from immigrant families. So even if the kids that we've worked with are not immigrants, their parents are. So um, so one of the things that um, that some of the programs we've worked with, like one science support uh, science uh, mentoring kind of program we've worked with, they bring in the families early on. So sort of like what Tommy, you know, was doing in trying to engage, you know, the community early on to figure out their perceptions of mentoring, this program includes the family from the very beginning in terms of, I guess, trying to figure out what are their needs, right. their perception, you know, about this mentoring program. And what are what could be some potential barriers, you know, in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. the program as well. Um, and then, you know, some of the things that uh, so the parents, so especially the parents are included along the way. Um, right. There's a lot of communication with them to to try to, I guess, um, better serve them, you know, in terms of some of the issues. And then I have one student who's actually doing his dissertation, looking at um, undocumented Latino youth, mm -hmm. and looking at how um, mentors, more informal mentoring relationships have 
you know, supported them along the way. And, and, you know, many of these youth are coming from, you know, mixed status, you know, kinds of families. And mm -hmm. the kinds of, and these are more youth who are on the successful side of things um, and being able to navigate the educational system and so forth and the kinds of individuals who have supported them along the way. I really appreciate you sharing that. I mean, just in my experiences uh, in working in youth development, young people who come from immigrant communities, oftentimes they are sort of not just the, uh, um, they're sort of the translators of what can often happen in the larger community, meaning that they oftentimes may run errands and they do translation. Yeah. Uh, and they may take on the role and become sort of what we call parentified, um, but on several levels. You know, they may speak and write English and their parents may not. Uh, regardless of whether or not they're Latino or African or Asian, but they take on these these roles in many ways. And I think it's really important for mentoring programs to understand that when you're working with particular communities, um, you have to begin to understand that there has to be an engagement with family. I always found that to be sort of a striking, uh, sort of uh, a promoted idea that it's just a relationship between you, the mentor, and the mentee. And that that's kind of, um, you know, uh, anathema to many of these cultural communities uh, and, and communities in general, quite frankly, but mm -hmm. in particular, many of these uh, people of color, many communities of color. Mm -hmm. Julia, you have um, anything else? Oh, yeah, sorry. Brian, we do have a couple more questions. I don't know how much more time we have, but one um, one question that came up, our panelists spoke earlier about how to measure cultural competency in our volunteers, um, but folks are wondering about how can we assess the strengths and the needs of young people with regard to their own racial identity so that you can support their development in your program. So how do you find out, you know, what young people's strengths and needs are with regard to their own racial identity so that you can help volunteers support them in that way? Um, we do have a, there's a measure that's used in research that looks at ethnic identity. Um, there's an, uh, that's, a, like, it's about 12 questions and it gets that, you know, their sense of belonging, you know, um, or maybe 11 questions, it gets at their sense of belonging um, in in their group, you know, um, whether they feel like, I guess, um, you know, they have pride, you know, about, about their group. And then I've seen some other ones that look at racial identity, um, where that looks at, like, what um, your perception about um, what your race means to you, so in terms of how you feel towards your particular group, how you think others perceive your group, you know, um, and your sense of how much is your racial identity a part of your, um, a central part of your identity, you know, as well. So, and I've seen, um, I guess, shorter versions of that too. I know there's a long version, but when I say shorter, for each of those things, I'm saying like maybe a few questions, like three, you know, kinds of questions to get at that. Um, so if folks were interested, you know, I could we could share that along with, I guess, the, the webinar, any materials that you guys put out there. Thank you very much. We've got about six minutes or so here. Is there one more question? If not, then I can sort of take over if we need to. Yeah, I think one, just one more really interesting question that we just got, um, which I think kind of relates a little bit to the one that was just answered by Bernadette, but um, how honest and transparent should mentors be with their mentees about their own racial identity and ethnic identity and their own experiences with their development in this area? Wow, that's a great question. Tori, you want to take a look at that? Take a, wanna... I do. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that the <laughs> thanks. I think that the experiences should should be shared. I think they should be transparent. I know that sometimes we worry that our young people can't handle a certain level of information. Uh, we don't want to, to harm them, but we we have to remember that that the society we live in on some levels and for a lot of these young people is already quite traumatizing, is already quite violent when it comes to racialized experiences. And I think the more that they understand that this is not just happening to them, um, and that as adults, we're still struggling to navigate some of these same issues. We're still struggling to figure out uh, how we live healthy, full lives. That I think, I think we become models and we become partners together. Um, I think that that's, I think it's important for each of us to see, for them to see our full humanity. 
Hmm. Very interesting. Appreciate that. Any other uh, responses to that, Tommy, Diego, or Bernadette? Yeah. The, the only thing I would say if at, on the onset, just from a more programmatic side, is that if uh, – because that could, that could be a very uh, – it could be – it could, it, it could ignite some things, so I would do it in a group setting. I would start out if you could do it in some type of maybe a couple men, couple groups, a couple mentor matches together, and uh, do it in a group setting, and then and, and see what kind of what comes out of that from a, just kind of from a more programmatic and kind of just having your hands on it in a way in which uh, you can be you can provide the resources that's going to need it after that if something does arise out of it. Thank you. Okay, um, a lot of what we've talked about today, obviously uh, working with uh, young boys and, and men of color, uh, we shared quite a bit of information uh, as it relates to this particular population and some best practices around cultural competency and training and so forth. Do we find from our experiences, um, and both as researchers and practitioners, that there are particular models uh, whether it be group mentoring, site-based mentoring, uh, embedding youth development activities. I mean, what sort of practices do you all feel, both from practitioner-based um, evidence and from research-based, work best for young boys and young men of color? Are there particular strategies um, and particular program designs that you think are in line with what we uh, have talked about earlier? Just to give a quick plug for a, coming out of the Youthville program and what they are doing at Youthville is with the young men of color. It's every young person, every young man of color, 16, 17, they're actually getting a mentor. But in addition to that, they have a, a group mentoring that they meet once a week and just to deal with uh, issues that actually uh, plague young men of color. And so, so combining the one-on-one -on -one mentoring and kind of well, not combining, but basically augmenting. A, a, the young men can kind of have a place of uh, where they feel a part of a team and they feel that they're not out there by themselves. So I think that was very important. But then in, in addition to that, they have a one-on-one -on -one mentor, a mentor they can kind of debrief with afterwards. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I think they're all important. You know, we're a we're a one to one mentoring organization, but um the, the thing that, that should be paramount is serving as many kids as possible and every kid is gonna need something different. And so making sure that there are options that are going to be, you know, that are gonna be um I guess something that the child wants to do, right? So we talked about maybe sports-based mentoring, right? If that's going to get more kids through the door and want to participate, then ultimately we're going to be, you know, helping a, a lot more children. And so making sure that we have all these options out there and and are are obviously executing them properly, but making sure that that there's different ways to get involved and access to a mentor is, I think, um, the most important thing that that we should maintain. Um, and yeah, and this is Bernadette, just to go along those lines, what Diego was saying, you know, I think, um, you know, knowing your audience is important. So mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily think that one way is the best way for, because mm -hmm. for boys of color, like as people have already said, that it's a really diverse group, you know, we, um, we've we been talking about some groups more than others, but I think you have to figure out your audience and also probably the reality, you know, in terms of feasibility and what are your resources, and what would be the best way to meet those needs? Thank you. Tori, anything? I, I agree with what my fellow panelists have said. All right. Well, thank you so much today. Uh, we want to thank all of our panelists for an insightful presentation and discussion. Uh, I'll go to that last slide, you guys. And thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Uh, you will be receiving a survey via email about your experience. Please. Do tell us what you think about it, uh, think about the webinar. Uh, your feedback helps to inform future uh, offerings. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can access the recording of the presentation from the link on the screen. You can also access all of our pre-recorded webinars and virtual trainings. And finally, if you have any questions uh, or comments, feel free to email us uh, at the email, uh, the emails listed uh, below here on your screen, listed on the screen. Uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you, and we really appreciate our participants and our panelists. And I want to thank everybody on behalf of MBK uh, Alliance and Mentor for being with us today.
enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.